mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Our text is the Old Testament lesson from Ezekiel chapter 37. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, O sovereign Lord, you alone know. And he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you, and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood on their feet, a vast army. And then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, This is what the Sovereign Lord says, O my people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and bring you up from them, I will put my spirit in you and you will live. I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done it, declares the Lord. <clears throat> That's the text, and this is a cool one. This is just one of those very cool scenes. Most commentaries describe it as a vision, and certainly Ezekiel is known for using a lot of metaphors and illustrations. On the other hand, the text simply says that the hand of the Lord was on Ezekiel and that he was brought out to the valley of dry bones by the Spirit of the Lord. And so I think we leave open the possibility that God simply wanted to put the exclamation point on what he was giving to Ezekiel to give to the people of Israel by actually doing what is described in that reading. He certainly can. After all, he is God. And if so, this is among many of the scenes in the Bible where I would have liked to be a little bird and just take it all in. Of course, in our high-tech world, we can actually see that kind of thing on the screen through computer graphics and movie magic. I thought very briefly about showing you a clip from The Mummy. I decided that wouldn't probably be a good idea. Most of the moms with little children would not probably appreciate that. And I don't think we need it to imagine what is being described here, but I think we do need to understand a little bit about the context of this event. And we've seen it in different ways before. Uh, for your purposes, in the conference room, we have a very excellent seven seas of history laid out on the wall, but I do want to give you just a brief timeline to place Ezekiel and what's happening in this prophecy. We could start from many places, but let's just take the glory days of King David, who solidified his control and the control of the Israelites over the Promised Land. That was around 1050 B.C. Unfortunately, the glory days didn't really last that long. Less than 100 years later, Solomon's sons basically brought the kingdom of Israel into civil war. And they split it from that point on in its history. The northern kingdom of Israel with ten tribes and the southern kingdom of Judah with the two tribes of Judah and Benjamin. And subsequent kings of both kingdoms basically led the people of Israel away from God and sometimes more rarely back to God. 
Isaiah and the so-called minor prophets like Amos and Hosea began to prophesy the destruction of Israel then because of their rebellion against the true God and their worship of false gods starting around 850 B.C. and following. And the Assyrians began the fulfillment of those prophecies by conquering the northern kingdom of Israel about 721 B.C. and hauling all of those people off into captivity in Assyria. King Nebuchadnezzar completed this, the prophecies of the minor prophets in Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel with the destruction of Jerusalem and taking the remaining Israelites into captivity in Babylon. That's where we have Daniel, remember Daniel in the lion's den, and his three friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Later, that's where we also have Queen Esther in the beauty contest, and she became queen and saved the people of Israel in Babylon from destruction. So that's also when Ezekiel makes this prophecy to the captives in Babylon. They are at their very lowest point. They've lost their promised land and their promised place, and they were languishing as slaves in exile. Their spirits were crushed. They absolutely could not see beyond their hopeless situation. So many were beginning to forsake their faith in God, who seemed to have forsaken them. That's when Ezekiel is brought out by the Spirit into the valley of dry bones. Again, in Ezekiel's words, they were very dry, with no life left in them. And in the middle of that scene of destruction and death, the Lord asks Ezekiel a very important question. Son of man, can these bones live? Ezekiel knows enough about God, I think, at this point, Uh, not to say no. So he gives the sort of non-committal answer, a safe answer, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. And of course, God does know. In fact, what he decides to do here is to give Ezekiel and the captives of Israel and us a preview of the resurrection that will not be just a spiritual resurrection, But what is actually going to happen when Jesus comes again, and this world and everything in it is totally destroyed and remade along with us. That's what we confess in the Apostles' Creed, the resurrection of the body at the last day, when God will actually take our dried up pieces and put them back together no matter how they've been scattered or decomposed or cremated. And our Lord is saying here to the Israelites and to us, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. Not just your spirit, not just your soul, but the body as well. Now, yes, in the immediate context with the Israelites... Ezekiel was prophesying to them that they would be able to return to Israel and rebuild the temple. And that prophecy was fulfilled. 538 B.C., when King Cyrus came in and wiped out Babylon, took it over, and allowed the Israelites to return. But as with many of the prophecies of the Old Testament, Ezekiel's prophecy has a now, not yet quality. Because their full restoration in ours, again, will not take place until God calls us to himself at the last day and gives us new, resurrected bodies and perfected bodies. Can't wait for that. Some of you with back issues and knee issues and so on, we will get perfect tens and be placed back here in a new earth. The Apostle Paul describes it this way. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable. So, at one point, God will do this. Some people will be living, so they won't have to be raised up from their grave. So we will not all sleep, he says, but we will all be changed. For the imperishable must clothe itself with the imperishable. By the way, this is what, if I'm still living and your pastor, I will speak over you 
when we put your body into the ground. So listen now, you probably won't be hearing it then. The perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. And folks, we so much need to hear that victorious message because all of us, at one time or another, get caught up living in the valley of dry bones and dry times when we're down and defeated and see no hope for our lives. I've been there with many of you. When life is hard, it's been my experience those times are easier to get into than to get out of, aren't they? And sometimes it's the big things that bring those feelings on. Financial crisis, sickness, loss of loved ones. But it doesn't have to always be big and threatening. Sometimes it's the little things that pile up. If you've ever read The Children, you might be familiar with Grover's Bad, Awful Day. And it was, right? If you remember, first he slept in and was late to playgroup. Then he ran to the bathroom and stubbed his toe. His toothpaste fell off before, off the uh, toothbrush before it got to his mouth. His comb got caught in his fur. His mother made him wear his rubber boots and he hated to wear his rubber boots. He forgot his lunchbox. His grape ice cream fell right off his cone onto the sidewalk and so on. Ever have one of those days? Before you know it, you find yourself getting more and more angry and frustrated. You know you shouldn't be letting it get to you, but it does. Folks, those are the times we need to hear the prophecy of Ezekiel. Oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. We need to hear and know and believe that the answer is in the word of the Lord, that it is His Word alone that has the breath of life and that can breathe into us at our lowest times and make our old bones live again. Now today we do celebrate the day of Pentecost. Penta meaning 50. Pentagram, right? Five sides. 50. The events of this day and the manifestation of the Holy Spirit on the disciples happened 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus. And so we continue to celebrate that event and the presence and power of the Holy Spirit who never left but is still with us and who came into you at your baptism. But it's interesting that when Peter and the disciples were preaching to those thousands of people, what were they in town for? The festival of Pentecost. That hadn't happened yet, right? No, it was an Old Testament festival. And what did it celebrate? If you dig into it, you realize it was the 50th day of celebrating the Passover of the Lord, by which God took them out of captivity, out of bondage in Egypt, and and started them on the road to the Promised Land. Also, it commemorated they believed 50 days after the, the Passover, the giving of the law, the Ten Commandments, to Moses at Mount Sinai. And I just find that a very curious coincidence, if it is, that God would link those two events in this way. The giving of the commandments to the giving of the Holy Spirit. In many ways, the law and the gospel. Something we couldn't keep to someone We can. Something that enslaves us and someone who sets us free. Something that shows us our sins and someone who shows us our Savior. I just think that's very cool stuff. And so was the new Pentecost, 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus, 10 days after the ascension of Jesus into heaven. The disciples have been left on their own in the world given the great commission by Jesus to go and make disciples, and there they sat for ten days, not doing that. Still scared. Total number of believers at that time was 120 people. 
Pretty small congregation. No Jesus around anymore. Everyone's still out to get them. Was it all over or was it all beginning? And we know the answer to that question. Jesus had told them, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And that is exactly what happened. Folks, only the power of the Holy Spirit can take a faltering fisherman who 53 days earlier had publicly denied he even knew Jesus and give him the courage to stand boldly in front of the very people who had Jesus crucified and publicly confess and proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord. We know that after that Pentecost sermon, 3,000 people were baptized and added to their number that day. And today, 2,000 years later, the same Holy Spirit continues to live in us. And that same power is still available to us. Only it is a radically different kind of power than the kind we're used to seeing. I mentioned CG and special effects earlier. Well, one of my favorite special effects in later years, don't judge me, has been the Incredible Hulk. How many of you can date yourself with me and remember the original Incredible Hulk? But yeah, okay. I like that, but I especially like it when they can really make him into the comic book hero. And that imaginary Marvel character has incredible power, right? But what kind of power? Rage. Hulk doesn't say much, but what's one of his phrases that I'm sure you know? Hulk smash, right? Well, folks, the very real Pentecost power is the exact opposite of the imaginary Hulk power. Hulk power comes when you lose your temper, swell up and turn green, and start smashing things. Once you use it, you almost always regret it, right? And it leaves you exhausted and depressed and having to buy another suit of clothes, all except for those stretchy purple pants. But the power of the Holy Spirit in your life is the power to keep you from swelling up and turning green and smashing the people that you love. It's the power to smile and experience the peace of God inside you instead of exploding all over somebody in anger and frustration. It's the power to forgive when you feel like smashing. It's the power to love when you feel like hating It's the power to rejoice and praise God in the midst of suffering, the power to have peace in your heart when you're troubled and afraid. Quite simply, it's the power all of us need. It's the power that held Jesus Christ to the cross when He bore there the punishment for everything you have done wrong and failed to do right. The power to love and forgive the very people who were crucifying Him and the power to love and forgive you. And that's a power unlike anything you will ever see in any Marvel movie magic. I'll use one more illustration. Did you know that the African impala or impala can jump to a height of over 10 feet and cover over 30 feet in a single bound? Yet I'm told these amazing animals can be kept in a zoo with a relatively short wall as long as the animals cannot see what's beyond it because they will not jump if they can't see where their feet will land. Folks, I don't want to live that way. I don't think you do either. Afraid to take a leap of faith for God to speak for Him and live for Him. I don't believe we have to live in that fear. I have a little secret I want want you to know about that's not really secret. Folks, you may not know what's out there, what's ahead for you, what scary thing is about to happen. But God does. In fact, God is there before you. The Lord Jesus said, I will ask the Father, and He will give you another counselor to be with you forever. 
the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither knows him nor or sees him nor knows him. But you know him. For he lives with you and will be in you. When the Holy Spirit is in you, that changes everything. I don't have the x-ray machine to look into everybody's heart this morning, but I can make an educated guess that there are at least some of you here this morning who are feeling kind of dried up in your life. Maybe you recognize your sin, the things you've done wrong and failed to do right. Maybe you listened to Peter's sermon and understand that it was you with the help of wicked men who put Jesus to death. You nailed him to the cross by your sins. And you truly feel the shame of your life and your actions or lack of actions for Jesus. Whatever your state before God today, please go to the valley of dry bones with Ezekiel and remember who has all power in heaven and on earth, to take even dried up people like you and me and breathe into you the breath of life and make you live again. The Word of God and the Spirit of God have great power. That Word is not based on your feelings or on the appearance of the moment, but on fact. And the fact is that Jesus Christ did come to earth to suffer and to die for you, The fact is that God made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Jesus who was dead is alive and lives forevermore. And that same Jesus can breathe life back into your dead situation, even back into a dead faith, and rekindle it by the power of the Holy Spirit. We know that one day God will open our graves and bring us out of them. Jesus said, do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. In the meantime, he can also lift you up today. Open your heart and your soul to the power of God, to the Holy Spirit. Let him dwell in you. Let him change you so that the life you present to others is by no means or will ever be a dried up or a dry bones life, but a life that is full and rich with purpose and hope. Amen. Let us pray. God, the Holy Spirit, I never really know what happens with the words that come from this pulpit. But I would pray today that you use them in a powerful way in each of us. People in our lives are looking at us. They know we come to this place. They know we're believers. Lord, we need to give them more than a dried up life. And so, Holy Spirit, I pray that you will fill us with life and hope and a future in such a way that it will pour out from us to the people around us, that you will be glorified and people will come to their Savior, Jesus. In his name, amen. May the peace of God, which passes our ability to understand it, keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen.